Hey everyone. So this video is going to talk about three different kinds of logic. Um, propositional logic, quantifier logic, and modal logic. So if you watch the video about validity, it's going to review some of those argument forms, but then also go beyond them, but trying to keep most of it at a relatively introductory level. So let's start with the question, what is logic? Logic is the study of what follows from what. Okay, so you might say, well, what are these what's that supposedly follow from each other? Uh, normally these what's are statements. Um, a statement or a proposition is the thought or idea that's expressed by a declarative sentence. So if you go back and review or watch, I have a video on the nature of truth where I talk a lot more about propositions and sentences and statements and how it all fits together. So go back and review that if you want um, some more background on what statements are. But examples of this are just basic declarative sentences, like it is raining, one plus one equals two, or all apples are fruit. So logic is the study of what statements follow from which other statements. All right, let's review the question, what is an argument? An argument is a set of statements. Some of those are premises and some of those are conclusions. And the premises support the conclusion or give reasons to believe the conclusion. And we're gonna examine arguments in standard form. When an argument is in standard form, the premises are numbered and each written on their own line. And then the conclusion is on its, is on its own line after the premises. So some examples of this, this is a purple flower. So this is a flower. Either it's raining or it's snowing. It's not raining, therefore it's snowing. And a lot of what this video is gonna do, it's gonna teach you how to make arguments in this form that are what's called valid using the rules of logic. So that brings us to this slide, valid and invalid. What is a valid argument? Well, an argument is valid, meaning it's impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion to be false or the truth of the premises guarantees the truth of the conclusion. So go back and if you, you know, haven't seen it, I have a whole video on validity. I recommend you watch that. I go into a lot more detail about what validity is. One thing I talk about a lot in that video is you should pretend that the premises are true when you're trying to figure out whether an argument's valid. So we determine whether an argument's valid first, and then after that, we go and assess the truth of the premises. So this video is not gonna be at all about assessing whether the premises are actually true or false. It's gonna be about what follows from what. Uh, in other words, when does a conclusion follow from an argument's premises? So this is a special use of the term valid. We'll say things like that's a valid point and that's not what we mean by valid. This is a different use of that term. Um, and in philosophy circles, most of the time when people say valid, they'll mean it in this way. So um, that might be a, a helpful heads up for some people. So an argument is invalid means it's not valid, <laughs> um, or it's possible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false, or the premises do not guarantee the truth of the conclusion. And so we're going to talk about argument forms today, some of which are valid and some of which are invalid. And validity is sort of the first step that makes an argument a good argument. Okay, so these arguments in a premise conclusion form, they fit certain patterns. This is sort of our first step into logic. Um, so for example, here's an argument. If Karen is Canadian, then Karen is nice. Karen is Canadian, so Karen is nice. This argument follows a particular pattern. If P, then Q. P, therefore Q, right? So each statement, the two that are relevant here is Karen is Canadian and Karen is nice. Those are assigned a letter, kind of like in algebra, if you remember back from like middle school or high school. Um, and it doesn't really matter what letter, we'll be using mostly P's and Q's, but we'll maybe use some A's and B's. And these letters just represent statements. And then these statements are connected with logical uh, terms, in this case, if and then. And then we can use those logical terms to determine whether the argument fits a certain valid pattern. And then we can see if the, the premises do indeed support the conclusion or not. Okay, so um, this 
PowerPoint program I'm using is really annoying. Uh, and if you have a chart, you can't have it uh, come in line by line. At least I couldn't figure out how to do it. So I'm modifying a little bit. That's why there's these white lines. So this slide represents terms that are used in logic, these logical connectives. And these connectives are very important in determining whether an argument fits one of these patterns that we're talking about. So here, so we're talking about three types of logic, propositional, quantifier, and modal. These are the terms that are going to be crucial for propositional logic. The first is what's called conjunction, just means and. The symbol for that is the whatever that's called, Anderson, I think, um, or like an upside down V. And there's disjunction, which is or, the symbol for that's like a V. There's negation, that just means not. Um, there's two different symbols for that, a little squiggly line or like a line with a little thing down it. Um, there's conditionals, so if P then Q, we're going to be talking more about these, um, and that can Either of those arrow-like symbols can indicate a conditional. And then finally, there's biconditionals. P, if and only if, Q. What that means is if P, then Q, and if Q, then P. And it's given by this double arrow type symbol. OK. So what I want to do now is go over a bunch of valid argument forms, and then I'll throw some invalid ones in there as well. and. Um, Hopefully with the examples, you can kind of intuitively see why these are valid or in the case of some of them invalid. We're going to go over more of the valid ones, though, because look, you want your argument to be valid. You want the premises to support the conclusion. Um, so this isn't going to be covering every single form, but this is covering more than what we talked about in the validity video. So the first is called negation elimination. If you have not not P, those knots cancel out and you can conclude P from that. So if it's not the case that it's not raining, you can conclude that it's raining. Then we have disjunction elimination. So if you have P or Q and then you find out not P, you can conclude Q. Um, and obviously too, if you find out not Q, you can conclude P, right? So here's an example, either it's snowing or it's raining, it's not snowing, therefore it's raining. Okay, next is disjunction introduction. And remember, disjunction means or, right? So if you know that P, um, you can conclude from that P or Q. So if I play basketball, I can conclude I play basketball or I play volleyball because an or is true if at least one of the two things, A or B, P or Q is true. Um, and then there's simplification. So from P and Q, you can conclude P. So if I say I'm tall and I play basketball, I can conclude from that that I play basketball. Okay, the next one is a hypothetical syllogism, also known as a chain argument, maybe a little more simply. So if you know that if P then, R, then Q, and you know that if Q then R, then you can conclude that if P then R. So if Bob is in San Francisco, he's in California. If Bob's in California, then he's in the US. So if Bob is in San Francisco, then he's in the US. Okay, and there's two of these, they're called De Morgans, and they basically use negation, so not, and an or, and they give us these cool little translations we can do. So if you know that it's not the case that P and Q, you can conclude not P or not Q. So if it's not the case that my pet is a dog and my pet is a cat, therefore either my pet is not a dog or my pet is not a cat. Um, here's a second one and I struggled to get an intuitive example of this, but hopefully it'll be clear. So if you know that it's not the case that P or Q is true, then you can, can conclude that not P and not Q. So if it's not the case that this basketball is purple or this basketball is green, that whole thing is false. This basketball is purple or this basketball is green is false. Then you can conclude from that, this basketball is not purple and this basketball is not green. All right, 
Now we're gonna spend a little bit more time. I know we did the chain argument, which involved conditionals, but I wanna spend a little bit more time talking about conditionals and then go over some more of the argument forms that involve conditionals. Okay, so a conditional is basically if P, then Q. P is what's called the antecedent. Um, it comes right after the if statement. Same conditional, Q is the consequent. So the consequent comes after the then. So you could think about it like this, antecedent starts with A, A comes first in the alphabet, C comes after A. Um, and you can also think about it like this, Q is the consequent, it's the consequence. So if P, then Q, Q is like the consequence. So maybe that's helpful to remember it. So one thing to note is that if P then Q is equivalent to Q if P, so you're just basically switching the order. Um, and you can also say P only if Q. This might sound weird in English sometimes, but this is the way that philosophers use these logical words. Um, so if and then only if um, function similarly to if then in these contexts. So here's some examples. Um, if you eat an apple, then you ate a fruit. So the antecedents, you ate an apple. The consequent is that you ate a fruit. And then this is gonna be equivalent to you ate a fruit if you ate an apple, or you ate an apple only if you ate a fruit. And that last one sounds a little bit weird, but it is technically uh, logically equivalent. So I think it's helpful to kind of know the way that only if functions in these contexts. All right, so we just talked about conditionals. Let's take a basic conditional, um, if P then Q. Given this conditional, there's actually four different forms uh, and then I guess also the chain argument, but setting chain aside, there's four forms that we can, argument forms we can make combining this conditional uh, with negation or not. Okay, so the first is what's called modus ponens, maybe one of the most common argument forms you'll see, just basically if P then Q, P therefore Q. So if Bob is in California, then he's in the USA. Bob is in California, so he's in the USA. This is a valid argument form. Okay, then there's modus tollens. Modus tollens is also a valid argument form. And again, it starts with if P then Q, but it takes that second part, the consequent, and says the consequent is false. So not Q, therefore not P. So if Bob is in California, then he's in the USA. He's not in the USA. And so we can know if he's not in the USA, then he's also not in California. Okay, so those are the two valid argument forms. Now, the next two we're going to talk about are invalid argument forms. It's a bad form of argument. The conclusion does not follow from the premises. The first is affirming the consequent. So if P then Q, again, the same if then statement we've been using this whole time. And then what we're saying this time instead is we're saying Q is true. So we're saying the consequent is true. And from that, we're concluding P. But this is not a good argument. <laughs> If Bob is in California, then he's in the USA, same one we've been doing. And then let's say we know that Bob is in the USA. We cannot conclude from that that Bob is in California because there's 49 other states that Bob could be in. So this is not a good argument for him. The final one is denying the antecedent. This is also invalid. So again, if P then Q, and this time we go back to the antecedent and we say the antecedent is false, so not P, therefore not Q. Okay, so here's an example. Again, if Bob is in California, then he's in the USA. And let's say we know Bob's not in California. Well, we can't conclude from that that Bob isn't in the USA for the exact same reason as with affirming the consequent because Bob could be in almost any other state. So I think it's kind of helpful to see how this is all laid out. If you have if P then Q and you either affirm P or deny Q, you're good, you got a valid argument. But if you affirm Q or deny P, not so good, invalid. Um, so those are sort of four of the main argument forms that we can derive from a basic conditional. Okay, now I wanna talk a little bit about a biconditional. And this is P if and only if Q, which you might remember means if P then Q and if Q then P. So P if and only if Q, what it basically means is P and Q are gonna stand together 
and they're gonna fall together just like the two little otters that are always together on the screen <laughs> Um, so from P, if and only if Q, you can conclude that if P is false, Q is false. If Q is false, P is false. If P is true, then Q is true. And if Q is true, then P is true. Um, and one thing to note, philosophers sometimes abbreviate if and only if as IFF. So if you see that when you're reading philosophy, it's not a typo. Um, what it means, again, is that P and Q stand or fall together. And sometimes IFF if and only if, is used to define a term. So if you say P if and only if Q, what that often means is that Q is the definition of P. Okay, so there's four, all of these are valid, four valid equivalence forms that we can get from biconditional. So on all four of these, we're gonna have P if and only if Q, but then our second premise will be different. So on this first one, we have not P, therefore not Q. So look, Bob's a bachelor if and only if Bob's an unmarried man. You know that Bob's not a bachelor, then you can know that Bob's not an unmarried man. P if and only if Q, not Q, therefore not P. So Bob's a bachelor if and only if he's an unmarried man. He's not an unmarried man, so he's not a bachelor. Again, P if and only if Q, then if we have P, we can conclude Q. Um, if he's a bachelor, then we can conclude he is an unmarried man. And then again, if we have Q, we can conclude P. So if he's an unmarried man, then we can conclude that he's a bachelor. So hopefully that makes sense. If you have a biconditional, if and only if, or if, 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 if <laughs> then the two things on either side, the P and the Q or whatever it is, they're always going to stand or fall together. Okay. So that was a basic summary of some of the valid argument forms for propositional logic. Um, there is more than that, but that covers a lot of the main ones. And so now what I want to do is just give a very basic overview of two other kinds of logic. The first is what we're going to talk about now. It's called quantifier or predicate logic. And then we're going to talk a very teeny tiny bit about modal logic. Modal logic is the logic of possibility and necessity. Uh, quantifier logic is um, about like existence and then it's making claims about groups as a whole. So you're kind of quantifying over objects is one way to think about it. Um, okay, so in quantifier logic, there's basically two main operators. There's the existential quantifier and the universal quantifier. So a backwards E and an upside down A represent each of these two. The backwards E basically just means there exists something. There's this thing exists. And then the upside down A is talking about a whole group and saying this whole group is a certain way. So you might say there exists a cat. <laughs> um, EX such that X is a cat, right? Or you might say all cats are animals. That would be AX and then cats are animals. Um, for all X, if X is a cat, then, then X is an animal. Okay. So we're gonna talk about a couple valid and invalid forms using quantifier logic. And what's cool is that a lot of these forms actually sort of parallel some of the forms that we just talked about. So notice that this first column, it says similar to. So that's not necessarily what it's going to be called, but it's going to be similar to an argument form that we just talked about. Okay, so here's one that's similar to modus ponens. It's a valid argument. All A's are B's. And then the green is how you would write that using the logical symbols. Um, X is an A, so X is a B. Here's an example. All cats are animals, Bob is a cat, so Bob is an animal. Okay, and we also have one that's similar to modus tollens. Uh, this would be all A's are B's, X is not a B, so X is not an A. Um, all cats are animals, my apple tree is not an animal, so my apple tree is not a cat. And again, both of these forms are gonna be valid. Both start with all A's are B's. So continuing with all A's are B's, now let's talk about two invalid forms. This should start to look familiar. This is gonna be, this first one is gonna be similar to affirming the consequent. So all A's are B's, X is not an A, therefore X is not a B. All cats are animals, 
Fido is not a cat, so Fido is not an animal. Imagine Fido is a dog, right? That's not a valid argument, right? Because Fido is an animal. He's a dog. He's just not a cat. So you can't conclude from all cats are animals and Fido is not a cat that Fido is not an animal. Okay, and the second one is going to be similar to denying the antecedent. So all A's are B's, X is a B, therefore X is an A. All cats are animals, Fido is an animal, therefore Fido is a cat. Again, it might be true that all cats are animals and Fido is an animal, but Fido could be a dog. Uh, no reason to think that Fido is a cat. Okay, so hopefully that is helpful like and easier to grasp since this, it's paralleling the argument forms that we just talked about with um, our first kind of logic. Okay, here's two more valid quantifier argument forms. This is going to be similar to sort of our chain argument. Um, so all A's are B's, all B's are C's, therefore all A's are C's. All Siamese cats are cats, all cats are animals, so all Siamese cats are animals. It's a valid argument. Um, I don't know. I don't know which argument form this one parallels, but here's another valid argument form in quantifier logic. No A's are B's. X is an A. Therefore, X is not a B. So no dogs are also cats. Fido is a dog. Therefore, Fido is not a cat. It's a good argument. At least a valid argument. <laughs> okay. So this brings us to our final kind of logic. This is gonna be modal logic, which again is the logic of possibility and necessity. So we're just gonna talk about some really basic terms. We're not gonna go into depth because modal logic gets very technical very fast. Okay, so modal logic has two main symbols uh, that play an important role. There's a box, the box is called box, <laughs> uh, and it means necessary or necessarily. And then there's the diamond. The diamond is called diamond and diamond means possibly. And okay, one interesting thing, you can actually define box and diamond in terms of each other. So box P necessarily P is actually equivalent to, it's not the case that it's possible that not P. <laughs> Um, if you think about that for a second, you might kind of see it. It's, so it's not the case that it's possible that not P. Um, and then possibly P, you can actually define in a similar way. So it's not the case that necessarily not P. That's the same as possibly P. So it's kind of cool. You can define them in terms of each other if you bring negations in. Um, so, so I think that's kind of an interesting thing. Um, here's some common principles of modal logic. And um, if you're not following all of these, it's okay. This is starting to get, get kind of intense. Um, so necessitation is not an axiom of modal logic, but I think a lot of people treat it as kind of a background assumption. And what that says is basically that if P is a theorem, which essentially means that if P is a logical truth, then P is necessarily true. So P has to be true. Um, one way that philosophers think about necessity, maybe I should have said this earlier, is there's possible worlds. There's all the different ways that the world could be. And logical truths, theorems, they're true in every possible world. Um, and then what it means for something to be, uh, so there's uh, necessity and then possibility. So, pos so if P is possibly true, what that means is P is true in at least one possible world. So necessary truths are true in all possible worlds. And then possible diamond P possible truths are true in at least one possible world. Okay, so the next um, principles we're going to talk about, those are axioms of modal logic. And the first is called distribution. So Basically, you can distribute a, a box if you have um, if P then Q. So if it's necessary that if P then Q, then if necessarily P, then necessarily Q. A little hard to get into a grasp of that one, but that's a common axiom. Um, this one's a little easier. So reflexivity means if P is necessarily true, then P is true. So if something's true in every possible world, it's true in the actual world. Okay, then there's what's called transitivity, 
which means that if P is necessary, so P is true in every possible world, then P is necessarily necessary. And I think you can actually put as many boxes in front of P as you want, as long as you know that P is necessary. Um, and so that's what's often called axiom four. And then you can actually build these axioms together to get modal logic systems. And so what's commonly called S4, um, all these systems are gonna affirm N, and then it also affirms K, T, and then four. So it affirms distribution, reflexivity, and transitivity. That's often called S4, which is a system of modal logic. Um, many people think though that the correct modal logic is slightly stronger. So I think a lot of philosophers, of course not all, are um, sympathetic to what's called S5. And that adds one more axiom to the four we've already talked about, which is acute, acu yeah. How do you say that? That's a great question. So it has to do with Euclid, but Euclidinity, maybe something like that. So that affirms that if P is possible, then necessarily P is possible. And so that's gonna be, um, when you combine that with four T, K and N, you're gonna get what's called S5, which is I think what a lot of people think um, accurately, uh, actually, accurately captures what's possibly true and necessarily true. Okay, here's a few other axioms. Maybe I'll say really quick in case people are interested. S5 is the one that's commonly appealed to for the ontological argument, which is uh, one of the arguments for God's existence, which basically starts with the idea that it's possible that God exists and then uh, eventually gets to the idea that God actually exists. So kind of a fun fact. Here's a few other principles of modal logic. D says that if P is necessary, then P is possible. It's pretty intuitive. B says that if P, then necessarily P is possible. And then we have two sort of modal logic de Morgans. The first is that if it's not the case that P is necessary, then it's possible, but not P. And then the second is that if it's not possible that P, then it is necessary that not P. So. So those are some, some kind of common principles. And a lot of times people will do is they'll take, there was five from the first slide and then these, and then kind of add them together to get different modal logic systems and play around with it. And you know sometimes they'll take an axiom away and make it weaker, add an axiom, make it stronger, kind of see what fun logical stuff we can do with this. I feel like some of you guys are like, that's so fun. And some of you are like, I can't believe people do that for fun. So people have very different reactions to this, but yeah, you can, add or subtract these axioms to kind of get different modal logics. Um, and here's a, a kind of cool fact that box and diamond actually have uses beyond just possibility and necessity. So you can actually model claims about ethics, claims about right and wrong with box and diamond. So box P means that P is obligatory. Um, diamond P means that P is permissible. You can also model epistemology using box and diamond. So box P would be that P is known, and then diamond P is that P is believed. So kind of fun, kind of fun extra application of modal logic. Okay, so that's all we're gonna talk about in terms of the three logics. Um, I did wanna kind of make a couple of book recommendations for people that want to go further in this. So I have a lot of books. Um, Feldman's Reason and Argument, that's the book that I normally use in my critical thinking class. Uh, Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow. This is an awesome book um, that talks a lot about cognitive biases that humans tend to exhibit. And I do think some of the experiments that Kahneman did didn't replicate, but at the same time, I think Kahneman's still right about a lot of his conclusions and it's just a fascinating book. So I highly recommend that book. Um, Vaughn, The Power of Critical Thinking. So Feldman's Reason and Argument book is actually out of print. Um, and so this Vaughn one is one that I know a lot of other people that teach critical thinking use and it's in print. So if you want a critical thinking book, you might check that out. Um, Nelson Lawn's Classical Logic and its Rabbit Holes. So if I were to teach a logic class, this is the text that I would use. And I think it goes all the way up through quantifier logic. So it doesn't talk about the modal stuff that we talked about, but it's a really good textbook. I know tons of people that use it, um, it comes highly recommended. So that's kind of the book I would recommend for logic. Um, a little bit more advanced is Ted Sider's book called Logic for Philosophy. If you're like a grad student or interested in logic or kind of wanting to get a little bit of a higher level, I would recommend this book. 
Um, another book that I've heard is really good and I've read part of is called More Precisely, The Math You Need to Do Philosophy. So that might be worth checking out. And then if you're interested in probability theory, Mike Teitelbaum has a book called Fundamentals of Bayesian Epistemology. And I think if you Google it, you should be able to find the first 10 chapters. So that's, that's a really great and helpful book for probability theory. And it's pretty accessible to you. Okay, so here's a, a brief summary of what we've covered today. We've talked about what is logic, which is the study of what follows from what. What is an argument? Arguments have premises that support the conclusion, which is a statement being argued for. What is validity? Validity is the idea that if the premises are true, then the conclusion has to be true. Then we've talked about a bunch of argument patterns. We've talked about conditionals, including what an antecedent is and what a consequent is. We also talked about biconditionals. And then after going through a bunch of argument forms, we're gonna talk about it in a second, I gave some book recs. Okay, here's all the argument patterns and principles we went over. So we went over a bunch of ones with negation, disjunction, conjunction. Then we talked about an if then statement and how you can get four patterns from that. Po modus ponens, modus tollens, which are valid, denying the antecedent and affirming the consequent, which are invalid. And then we talked about the four versions of the equivalence argument, which involves the biconditional. And then we talked about six different argument forms with quantifier logic, first two valid, middle two invalid, last two valid. And then we talked about some of the common axioms of modal logic, what S4 and S5 are, and how you can kind of add these different axioms together in order to get different logical systems. So I hope this was helpful for people and I'll see you guys later.